Good evening, everybody. My name is Dana Dennis Smith. I am the founder of The Next 100 Years, and I'm also the trustee of Spark 21, the parent charity of this organization. As some of you may, uh, may know, um, The Next 100 Years is the new project from the team behind the first 100 years, a five-year campaign which was created to chart the journey of women in law in celebration of the centenary of the Act of Parliament that opened the way to women to qualify. The next 100 years, this chapter is focused very much on achieving equality for all women in law. It aims to accelerate the pace of change by encouraging collaboration across the legal profession, improving the visibility of all women in law and supporting the women lawyers of the future. We're gathering tonight because we have a very important milestone to celebrate. We're celebrating a very important legal pioneer in Dame Ross Heilbronn. In January 1972, she became the first female judge to sit at the Old Bailey. Tonight, therefore, we aim to celebrate Rose's life, her work and her legacy 50 years on, as the Old Bailey have managed last year to achieve gender parity. To open our evening tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Lord Burnett, the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. Lord Burnett was called to the bar at Middle Temple in 1980, the inn that also admitted Helena Normanton, the first woman on the 24th of December 1919. In 2001, he became a bencher of the inn. From 1982, he practiced at Temple Garden Chambers, serving as head of chambers from 2003. Lord Burnett served, served as a recorder until 2008, when he was appointed as a judge of the High Court in 2008 and knighted the same year. He sat in the Administrative Court and was promoted to the Court of Appeal in 2014, becoming a Lord Justice of Appeal. In October 2017, aged 59, he became the youngest Lord Chief Justice since Lord Parker. He was awarded a life peerage in the same month. I'm delighted to be able to welcome Lord Burnett to introduce tonight's event and to give the um, introductory remarks on Ross Highburn, Lord Chief Justice. Thank you, Dana, very much indeed. And it's my really great pleasure to introduce this celebration of 50 years since Rose Heilbronn first sat as a judge at the Old Bailey. She was the first woman to do so, as you noted. And it's quite remarkable sitting in January 2022 to appreciate the cultural and professional obstacles that inhibited the progress of women in the legal profession in general, uh, even after the legal disqualification for practice was lifted. Uh, th this evening, as you've indicated, is part of the next 100 years project with its focus in particular on the next 10 years um, with the invaluable work of Spark 21. And on behalf of all of those who've joined this evening, can I thank you and Spark 21 for all the work that you're doing. I've spoken frequently about the importance of increasing greater and achieving greater diversity in the judiciary and also in the legal profession. And tonight perhaps is not the occasion to rehearse the reasons why it's so important that collectively we do so, and um, because all those attending will know them all too well. But diversity and particularly gender diversity has been very much in my mind this week, not only because of tonight's celebration of Rose Heilbronn's 50-year milestone, uh, but also um, because earlier this week, Mary Arden retired from the Supreme Court. Lady Arden, um, as I think many people know, like Rose Heilbronn, um, is a daughter of Liverpool. And she was called to the bar in 1971, and so there's a, a, a happy, synchronous um, coincidence uh, in, in comparing the lives of two very distinguished women judges. When she was called in 1971, 
uh, as she has explained, including at her valedictory, there were still many obstacles in the way of women practicing at the bar. And she went to the Chancery Bar, which was then an entirely male domain. So the removal of legal dis disqualification in 1919 was really only the start of the progress through the professions of, and into the judiciary of women. As everyone knows, it was painfully slow. And although it has accelerated in recent years, there's still a good way to go. And the, the, the early opposition to the removal of the legal disqualification seems to me to have re represented a rather deep-seated cultural difficulty of men in particular coming to terms with the fact that women are just as capable as men at everything. I, I think I can sense many of you thinking, and perhaps better, but the lack of enthusiasm amongst many for allowing women to practice at the bar and as solicitors reflected at precisely the same time a real resistance to equal suffrage, not only in the United Kingdom, but over the world. And for those of you who have time or the inclination, dig out some of the parliamentary debates on women's suffrage before the First World War and leading up to the uh, introduction of women's suffrage. Remember, even then there were differences between the men who were allowed to vote and, and, and the women. And giants of the day were deeply opposed to it. Um, Herbert Asquith, for example, was one. And so too, at, at least before the First World War, was uh, Winston Churchill. And uh, I was reflecting recently given 50 years is being celebrated here tonight, that last year, Switzerland celebrated 50 years of women having the vote. They only got it in 1971. So it tells you a lot about how things were and how things have changed and continue to change. But we know that the removal of disqualification didn't immediately open the door to women to be able to practice freely in the law on either side of the professions. I, I think Rose Heilbronn can truly be described as a trailblazer. I'm afraid I didn't have the opportunity of appearing in front of her when she was a judge, although I was in practice, as you've indicated, for a few years before she retired. But all I can say from what I've read and learned is what a remarkable woman she must have been. Uh, others will tell you much more. Uh, but at this stage, perhaps all, all I need say is that she entered a male world at a time when there were very few women practitioners at the bar. Uh, very quickly, she developed an enormous practice and was recognized as being one of the outstanding practitioners of her time. She took silk in 1949 when she was only 34 years old. Now there have been a handful of other people in history who've taken silk that young, but it really is no more than a handful. And I think for a woman to do it in 1949 um, is itself something that demonstrates the quite remarkable and outstanding ability of, of Rose Heilbronn. And then, as I think all of you know, she was one of the leading criminal and indeed civil practitioners of her day. You're going to hear much more about her, and I, I'm conscious that um, Hilary Heilbronn, her daughter, and Sir Christopher Rose will be having a discussion in a few minutes and uh, can speak from uh, personal experience. But glancing at some of the materials ready, readily available, it's obvious that she became something of a, a media personality as well as a, a legal personality. And obviously that may in part have been 
as a result of how unusual it was to have a stellar female silk. But the reality is that she was doing many of the biggest and most difficult cases of her day. And as is obvious to everybody then as now, doing them quite uh, remarkably well. I know Hillary's written a, a biography of her mother, um, which tells us so much about the realities of trying to practice in those days. And there was one, one, one vignette, which I hope I've got accurately, I'm sure I'll be contradicted if I haven't, that um, even though she was one of the leading practitioners on the Northern Circuit, she wasn't able to attend bar messes because they didn't allow women to attend. I mean, if that's right, it speaks volumes, doesn't it, for how slowly the legal profession accepted the cultural changes that, that should have come immediately with women joining the ranks. But she is um, not only remembered as a remarkable judge and a remarkable uh, advocate, but we, we still have the benefit of um, screen versions, or at least uh, a screen version uh, based upon her work, um, available to be viewed. Uh, before my time even, I'm afraid, as a, as, 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 as a child, um, Margaret Lockwood uh, appeared in uh, a program, a, a drama called Justice in Women, I think in 1969, and then it led to a TV series called Justice. And uh, I'm aware of it only because it's showing at the moment on um, a program that show, shows old TV series called Talking Pictures, Channel 91, for those of you who, who are interested. Uh, and I've picked up one or two of the episodes lately. So the drama and the reality can come together this evening. Now, I suspect that the old Bailey that Rose Heilbronn encountered in 1972 was very different from how it is now. You've mentioned that there's gender balance at the old Bailey and hooray for that. I, I think you will be hearing from a number of people who will be able to chart some of the intervening years and certainly the panel at the end will be able to uh, explain to you how things are today. But in, in all walks of life and particularly in, in, in our profession, there are occasionally some people who genuinely can be described as giants and as trailblazers and Rose Heilbronn was undoubtedly one of them. And I hope in the next few minutes, we'll hear Hilary and Christopher uh, talk about her from their knowledge and we'll learn more. Thank you. Thank you so much for your um, remarks and certainly for reminding us what a giant she was among legal professionals in her time. The next part of tonight, um, we will hear from Hilary Heilbrunn in conversation with Sir Christopher Rose. I'll quickly say a few words about each and um, then we will go and hopefully you'll enjoy hearing more about um, their uh, reminiscence of, of Rose and her times um, at the bar. Hilary is a barrister at Queen's Council, practicing from Brick Court Chambers in London. She has extensive experience as counsel, both in international um, arbitration and commercial and arbitral related litigation, and has acted for a wide range of national and international clients. She also regularly sits as an international arbitrator, both in the UK and abroad. She is, importantly, the daughter of Rose Halbron QC and her mother's biographer. Her biography of her mother is called Rose QC. Joining her in conversation tonight is Sir Christopher Rose. Sir Christopher is a former judge of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales and a member of the Privy Council of the United Kingdom. He became Vice President of the Criminal Division of the Court of Appeal in 1997. In 2002, he was Treasurer of Middle Temple. On uh, the 24th of April 2006, he retired and soon afterwards he was appointed Chief Surveillance Commissioner, a post which he held until 2015. I would like to welcome Hilary and Sir Christopher to have a conversation about Rose's legacy, 
as well as the times in which you lived and practiced. Hilary, Sir Christopher. Good evening, everybody. Can I first of all say how honored and humbled I am, and I'm sure my mother would have been too, uh, at this event taking place in her honor, and to thank Lord Burnett for those very kind words uh, and the things he said about her. Um, we have got only a short time to talk about uh, a life which had vast breadth, uh, many remarkable achievements, uh, and has many interesting uh, aspects. But we will do our best to try and draw on one or two vi vignettes uh, of my mother's life. Uh, my experience, obviously, was as her daughter. So I saw her primarily as a mother, uh, and it was only really uh, re researching for her biography uh, that I learned a lot about her in her prime as an advocate, uh, because in those days, I suspect I was more interested in dolls and such like. But Sir Christopher, uh, who is sitting beside me, uh, came across her in her various guises uh, and can tell, I know, I know some more tales uh, additional to those uh, alluded to by Lord Burnett. So before I say a few things uh, about my mother and comment perhaps a bit on the Old Bailey, uh, perhaps I can hand over and ask Sir Christopher, when was your first recollection of, of mum in her professional capacity? How did you come across her? Uh, in the early 1960s, uh, when I was a very junior junior counsel to her leading in a murder case at Lancaster Assizes. Uh, thereafter, I had the good fortune to know her for 40 years, uh, not only uh, in relation to uh, the law, but also in relation to the various aspects of the law in which uh, we, if I can put it this way, came across each other. Uh, she was uh, an absolutely outstanding advocate. Uh, she worked hard. She analyzed her cases uh, with scrupulous care. She uh, presented with a most marvelously mellifluous voice, which uh, entranced juries who listened to her. Uh, I referred uh, a moment ago to our first meeting. In those days, the uh, newspapers used to carry detailed descriptions of criminal trials, uh, opening speeches, cross-examination of witnesses, and the like. And so the jury before whom, led by her, I appeared in the early 1960s, felt that they knew her because they had read about her and they hung upon every word. Tell me uh, uh, on the circuit, how, how was she perceived? Did she come across prejudice? Can you give some examples? Uh, <clears throat> I, I can certainly give two very striking examples to one of which the Lord Chief Justice has recently referred. Uh, that is the fact that in the early 1970s, and I stress that period, she was still not allowed to go to Bar Mess. Bar Mess was an event which took place in assize towns uh, when the High Court judges were sitting and male members of the circuit used to gather twice a week uh, in order to uh, chat among themselves uh, and otherwise keep their fingers on whatever pulses were within their reach. 
Rose was not allowed to go to Bar Mess, and that became an interesting complication in 1973 when the circuit wanted her to be its first woman leader. And the fact that she didn't go to Bar Mess because she was not permitted to go to Bar Mess uh, was an obstacle which clearly had to be circumvented before she could, as she did, become the first woman leader. The other example in answer to Hillary's question uh, of the prejudice uh, against uh, women was that having become a QC in 1949, uh, she had to get permission from the circuit that is the Northern Circuit, I'm ashamed to say, to which I, uh, like she, uh, belonged, to uh, not have to comply with the circuit rule. The circuit rule prohibited new silks from living on circuit. And bearing in mind that in the same year that Rose uh, became a QC, uh, she had given birth to uh, the distinguished lady on my left. Uh, and bearing in mind that by uh, that time, uh, the circuit rule still existed, she had to get uh, an uh, exemption from it. And in order to have an exemption from it, she had to be interviewed by a group of senior male QCs from the circuit, who graciously uh, allowed her uh, to not have to comply with the circuit rule, so that it was actually possible for her to live with her, her husband as well as with her newborn baby by not living uh, uh, off the circuit. The purpose of the circuit rule, and I will just be very brief on that, was supposedly to ensure that members of the circuit who took silk would move to London and the influence of the Northern Circuit would then be felt in legal quarters in London. It was a magnificently inadequate rule because, for example, Fenton Atkinson QC, who later, later became a member of the Court of Appeal, instead of moving to London, moved to Castle in Scotland. If I could just perhaps pick up and give a little insight into one or two of those things. Um, my mother, Christopher's mentioned, had a mellifluous voice. It, it was often said in, in those days, and, and probably even when I came to the bar, that one of the reasons women would not be good barristers is because they had high-pitched voices, particularly uh, when they wanted to project their voice. Uh, that was something that couldn't be said against my mother because she had a trained voice. Uh, her mother uh, put her through elocution lessons and she actually received a licentiate of the uh, London Guildhall School of, I think it was the drama or speech, uh, and therefore was able to project her voice without it reaching a tom, which the gentleman of the day didn't like. But that was often, and uh, even into the early 60s, was used as a reason uh, for women not to go to the bar. I think another thing that emerges is that uh, Christopher mentioned uh, her, her various stages and difficulties she had. Uh, and one of the things she always used to say to me was that certainly in those days, she had to be patient because although she made it, she made it a lot later than she would have done had she been a man. And everything came later. Uh, years later sometimes uh, than otherwise it would have done. Uh, and finally at this stage, perhaps 
just to mention that uh, she had, uh, as I think Lord Burnett also mentioned, a very high profile. Uh, she was very famous. She was often in the newspapers, not just for her cases. Uh, she would promote women. She would speak all over the place. Uh, but the interesting thing was, in those days, it was professional misconduct to speak to the press. So she couldn't give an interview or pose for a photograph. Uh, nonetheless, uh, she had a staggering press, uh, and my research showed that it was all laudatory, something that people will pay uh, an enormous sum of money to have these days. Uh, but that may be simply because she didn't speak to anybody and they had to take their own view of her. Uh, unfortunately, it was all favourable. So that, I'll just pause there uh, and perhaps we'll ask Christopher for uh, a view of, of when she was a, a judge. Did you, how did you know her then? Uh, well, I knew her uh, in, uh, as a judge uh, at various stages because after our first meeting in the early 1960s, I next appeared before her when she was sitting as a commissioner of a size in Manchester. That was in effect sitting as a deputy high court judge. And I did a four week case uh, in front of her. Uh, after that, uh, there was an occasion in the uh, early 1970s uh, when I appeared against her, prosecuting her at Westmoreland Court of Sessions when she was defending uh, a, a receiver of stolen goods. Uh, then, uh, eventually, uh, in uh, the... Uh, uh, by, the uh, uh, by the time uh, she uh, had become a High Court judge, we eventually finished up both sitting as High Court judges uh, in Liverpool and sharing lodgings together. And that was a great joy. And I, there in particular, enjoyed her great sense of humour and her charisma and the other qualities that made her such an outstanding advocate and a, such a conscientious judge. One tiny little uh, description of her uh, uh, appearing before her in her judicial capacities, she used to take notes in the most in enormous speed, at most enormous speed, and in very, very large handwriting, with only two or three words to the page. But she made a full note, and she knew what was going on, and she adjudicated. Yes, she went, she went through a lot of judicial notebooks, uh, and one of her other uh, tricks was to have a, a whole variety of different colours. I never worked out what purple meant, but there were a series of colors uh, for different things. And if you went through some of her cross-examination notes, uh, you would see things highlighted in red or, or whatever. Uh, but Christopher picked up on, on her sense of humor. And I remember as a child at home, she had the most infectious laugh. And if you got her going and you got going as well, you would have uh, pains in your stomach uh, until my father who likewise had a sense of humor would come in and perhaps uh, dampen it down a little bit. Uh, but uh, tonight we're celebrating the Old Bailey and uh, that like a lot of her more famous cases got a lot of publicity at the time. Although in fact, professionally, uh, people perhaps don't realize it wasn't the stepping stone uh, um, which really justified such a, a amount of publicity. The really important milestone was when she became recorder of Burnley, uh, some by maths is right, 16 years earlier in 1956, because she was then the first woman senior judge. Uh, and that was a huge uh, milestone. And the reason that she went to sit at the Old Bailey was because they reorganized the court system. 
so that instead of being allocated to a particular town, uh, you were allocated to a circuit. And she chose to sit uh, on the southeastern circuit, which included the El Bailey. So uh, that was how she came about it. Uh, and it, uh, it was uh, significant uh, in, in many ways because uh, it was the El Bailey. Uh, but the real uh, achievement was the first one when she became a recorder in the first place. But um, one or two other perhaps uh, amusing things about the El Bailey, which I do refer to, but I do remember as a child, uh, it being reported that in the States, in what was then the Washington Evening Star in one of their early editions, congratulating her on becoming the first female criminal at the El Bailey. And I remember my mother and our, I having a glorious two or three hours thinking what we might do with the damages that we could receive uh, as a result of this uh, defamatory remark. Fortunately uh, for them, but perhaps not for us, they corrected it in the next edition uh, with a letter of apology. Uh, and so our ideas of riches, riches, I'm afraid, soon faded. But uh, let me just talk for a moment uh, on her legacy, because I'm always asked about that. Uh, and I think it is clear from what we've said, and we've only been able to touch on it today, uh, that she was an inspiration to many. And I think it was because she became such a household name, not just in the sense of her cases being recorded at length, uh, but also because she was voted Woman of the Year in the Daily Mirror in one year. She was in women's articles. And also she spoke and promoted women's rights at a time when it was perhaps not as normal to do so, promoting uh, equality of pay for women, equality of opportunity for women, uh, as well as many ideas for law reform, some of which, but not all of which in both cases have come to fruition. Uh, but she was photogenic, uh, and I think that, that was another reason that the press liked her. She was young and she was beautiful, but she was also more practically a working woman, working mother and working wife, which was quite unusual in those days. And as Christopher mentioned, there was that very difficult occasion where she had to justify herself to 12 men but that she actually wanted to live with her husband. And I think that was what was one of the unusual things, that she was perceived not just as a career woman, uh, but as a career woman who had a home life. Uh, and that you would see sometimes articles about people meeting her at functions, expecting her just to talk about uh, rarities of the law. But actually, she was more interested in the new dishwasher she brought because she bought because she was a, a keen a gadget lover. So I think those are uh, important factors. She had the most enormous stamina. Uh, she was determined uh, and she loved her job. And to her, it was her hobby. She loved her home and her family life as well. But I think the legacy that she has learned, left is that she's shown others that it can be done. Uh, and she's inspired a generation of young lawyers who in turn now have inspired others uh, to pursue the path uh, of the law. Uh, and I think the O'Bailey is perhaps one of the many uh, achievements that she had, uh, and it happens to be the anniversary today. And I'm sure she particularly would have been delighted to learn that in that 50th year, uh, coincidentally, uh, we reached uh, parity of uh, judges uh, at the Old Bailey. Uh, and that is a remarkable achievement, given that it took so long to get the first, uh, and it has taken quite a long time to get the second uh, achievement. But uh, hopefully things will continue uh, to progress for women. Uh, one has to thank Dana for everything she's done, both uh, in relation to the last 100 years and also what she's doing in relation to the next 100 years uh, to promote women at the bar and in the judiciary and the, in the solicitor's profession uh, and more widely. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that is something that is to be admired. 
And I hope that this evening, recognizing my mother's achievement, uh, will encourage others to realize that it can be done, uh, not to be put off by the obstacles that happen from time to time, uh, but to enjoy it uh, and to enjoy all aspects of one's career and family life that go with it. I don't know whether there's anything further you want to add, Christopher, or I think our time is probably up. Well, I think the uh, Lord Chief Justice had the mot juste, as one would expect uh, of the Lord Chief Justice. She was a remarkable woman. And I should say that I'm privileged to have been her daughter. I think that probably concludes our session and thank you all very much for listening. Thank you so much, Hilary and Sir Christopher, for bringing her to life. It's so wonderful to hear stories about the person behind the legal personality and, you know, the media personality. Um, so as a next um, uh, bit in the programme, before we move on to the panel, we want to bring a little surprise. Hilary doesn't know about it. But we asked the current judges of the Old Bailey to share with us what her legacy means to them. And we made a little film. Um, and this is it. I hope you enjoy it. Rose Heilbronn was born within a few years of my grandmother, but when I was a child, she'd become legendary for the women in my family because she'd done what they had only dreamed of. She'd broken through the system and demanded that it recognize women for what they could contribute. Amongst her very many firsts, in 1972, she was the first woman to sit, albeit temporarily, at the Old Bailey. That she was exceptional, there could be no doubt. But because she was exceptional, it took a long time to build on her achievements. After her, Nina Lowry was the first full-time appointment in 1987, and Anne Goddard the second in 1997. I was the third, appointed in 2011 and beginning to sit at the Old Bailey in 2012. That year, I was asked by my all-women's college to write about the experience. The first paragraph of what I then wrote reads thus. I'm sitting on the bench at the Old Bailey. Any minute now, a prisoner will clank his way up from the cells. He'll stand politely in front of me while I recite the litany of his sins and the number of years he must spend purging them then he'll clank back down again. It sounds like a staging post between Deuteronomy and Dickens, but it isn't. It's my daily working environment. At one o'clock, I will leave my courtroom and go up to lunch with other judges. Over our meal, we will compare notes of our mornings. 
Beneath our feet, defendants will do the same. There is this noticeable difference. Amongst the prisoners, there will be a number of women, but I am the only full-time female judge at the Central Criminal Court, at least for the moment. There is more sexual equality in the cells than there has yet been achieved in the Judicial Appointments Commission. But they're working at it. That's what I wrote in 2012. By 2021, that work had paid off. By then, half the full-time judges at the Central Criminal Court were women. That is Rose Heilbronn's legacy. It's what she's given us. And I like to think it's what we, in our turn, have given back to her memory. I hope you enjoyed those words um, from the Old Bailey uh, judges that are currently sitting there. We're moving now into the last part of the evening. As we said um, in the chat, we are going to take some questions and we, I will try to address them to the panelists as we go for the evening um, so we can keep to time. So I'd like to um, tell you a few words about each of our, our panelists for the next session. Um, we will be joined by Her Honor Judge Anujadir QC. She was called to the bar in 1989. She practiced as a barrister for 23 years, mainly in crime and from 2007 as a special advocate in national security cases. She was a member of a number of bar council committees, including the Equality Committee, the Professional Conduct Committee and the Law Reform Committee. She was appointed as a judge at the Old Bailey in 2017, as a circuit judge in 2012, and a recorder in 2010. In 2018, Anuja was authorized to sit in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. She was appointed to the Judicial Appointments Commission, Commission as a judicial member in two, uh, 2018 and reappointed in 2021. She has been involved in advocacy training in the UK and abroad for over 20 years. In 2015, she was appointed as a tutor judge for the Judicial College. Um, we will also be joined by Laurie Ann Power, Q well, soon to be QC. Um, she is a leading criminal barrister, media consultant, and mentor. She has appeared before the Court of Appeal, Courts Martial, and worked on the international criminal trials in Sierra Leone. She is also the treasurer of the Criminal Bar Association, a member of the Bar Council's Working Group on Race, chair of Women in Criminal Law. Uh, Race Equality Committee and Chair of Pupillage at 25 Bedford Row. She was the winner of the 2019 UK Di Diversity Legal Awards Lawyer of the Year uh, and in 2020 she was nominated Barrister of the Year at the Women in Law Awards. She took silk recently and she will pick up um, her new title, the last two letters uh, after her name in March. The next guest will be Professor Jo Delahanty QC. She is one of the UK's leading family barristers specializing in child protection law. She rose to prominence and has won industry awards for her work in contentious cases involving complex medical evidence and cat catastrophic injuries contributing to the death of a child, child sex abuse, witchcraft abuse, and ISIS radi uh, radicalization cases. She was called to the bar in 1986, appointed a Queen's Council in 2006, became a recorder in 2009, and was made a bencher of Middle Temple in 2011. Jo was Gresham Professor of Law from 2016 to 2020, a role that she performed alongside her full-time still practice at four paper buildings. She was made an Emeritus Gresham Professor of Law in 2020 and awarded a fellowship in recognition of her contribution to the reputation and reach of the college. And uh, the last but not least um, of our guests is uh, his honor judge, Mark Lucraft QC. He's the recorder of London, the lead judge at the Old Bailey. He was appointed to the post with effect from April, 2020. Between 2016 and 2020, Mark was the chief coroner of England and Wales. He was initially appointed as the chief coroner for a three year term and then reappointed. Uh, for another two years. Uh, he was authorized to sit as a Deputy High Court Judge in November 2016. Prior to his appointment as the Recorder of London, he was a Senior Circuit Judge at the Old Bailey from um, 2017 and a Circuit Judge from 2012. 
I would like to welcome all of you to the stage. So I'd like us to continue the conversation we've heard about, um, you know, the early years of women pioneers from the Lord Chief Justice, then we heard more about the woman that was um, Rose Hybron from her own daughter and Sir Christopher. And I wanted us to go now a little bit into um, today, in today, today's world of women in law, what they can expect to happen to their careers, but also the aspiration for the next generation um, coming through. Obviously, we had some good news today about the number of women recorders appointed. I think it's you know, pretty close to 50%, um, percent, which is a great, a great announcement to um, reach us on this day of celebration. So I'm really pleased with that. We had an increase in number of women QCs earlier. Um, we have one of them here to do with us tonight. Um, and, but equally, we had a report today uh, from the young barristers um, telling us about their fears of, for the future, their concerns about where their careers are going. So I hope we will be able to touch on many topics but before we start, I'd like to ask you about Rose and how um, you feel about what she left and what you could, um, if you like, continue from her work. So I'll start with Anuja as a first herself. And I'll let you explain in what way, Anuja, if that's um, OK, um, both as a recorder and as an old Bailey judge. How has she, if you like, guided your career? I think Rose has taught us um, uh, that you shouldn't let barriers stand in your way and that if you want to achieve something and you think you'll be good at it uh, that you have to carry on uh, despite the downsides and despite the, the things that may be there that will stand in your way now there's a lot that's changed because of uh, Rose Harbon and I think the women coming into the profession now or actually established within the profession can and will expect to be treated very differently from the way that Rose was treated but that doesn't mean to say that there won't be challenges and issues that arise along the journey that they take. So I'll go next to Mark also to stay within the old baby for the time being. How does it feel for you to have shared the recorder, you know, to the uh, uh, role with, with her, to, to know about her role in the old baby? How has it influenced you? What did you know about her as you were coming for the profession? I'm sure us women, we kind of read up about our legal uh, pioneers uh, that are female and work before us, but has that influenced you in some way? And what did you know about Ross Harbin and how did she impact your own career? I knew quite a bit about her, but I think one of the um, people that I remember when I was first in the chambers I was in before I became a judge uh, was a silk called Linda Stern. And she, again, was very much a sort of um, somebody that I admired for making um, very difficult um, um, life, you know, with, with children and also wanting to be a QC and having a stellar career. And I think it, it's really very good. I, I am acutely aware that um, it's hugely important going forward that we have a judiciary drawn from as wide a um, um, circulation of the practicing bar and solicitors as we possibly can. And I think people like Rose Harbron have really made it um, very clear that actually, as Anuja said, you can get to where you want to go if you set your heart on it. And I hope that many of the barriers that we heard about um, in the earlier talks, we heard about her career. I hope many of those barriers have now gone. I hope that actually now that we've got gender parity, it will encourage many more people to apply to become judges both here and elsewhere, uh, where I say it's hugely important for all of us that we have a truly diverse judiciary drawn from all sectors of our society, all backgrounds, all genders, and actually we make sure that that is the way that we go forward. And Lorianne, because you operate in the criminal <laughs> side of the of the profession, what was the kind of, you know, what did you know of her as you were coming up? Was her trailblazing career known to you? and? The short answer is not enough and actually it's, it's a real missed opportunity because because she was such a starkly beautiful woman that picture is something that we're all familiar with but actually when you read about her career for me personally it's a really humbling read because we today in 2022 we have gender parity for example at the Old Bailey um, but we know that there are still huge obstacles in place um, that we, we don't need to go through. We all know what they are. But for her operating back then, 
the barriers and the obstacles were, you know, far more entrenched in a system that was unwilling to change. And she almost single handedly, because there really was a very few of them, she almost single handedly dismantled a profession that had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years um, in spite of in spite of women and not because of them. And so um, for me, it's humbling. She was a woman. She was an activist before activism was a thing. She was a mother. She was exceptionally gifted as an advocate and a lawyer but also when you go into the details of her cases so for example in 1944 she was junior counsel to um, a West Indian cricketer who was refused entry because he was black I mean that is um, the kind of work that we now are really seeing as, as groundbreaking and she was doing it way way back before we, we even deemed it to be something that we should stand on. And so for me, she's a humbling, exceptional woman. And I, I, I'm so grateful to you, Donna, because this is the kind of thing that students should learn about um, in, in order to motivate them to break down, to continue to break down the barriers. Oh, thank you. Joel, what so, did Rose mean to you? Well, I, I think I fell in love with Rose a little bit when I was preparing a lecture for Gresham. Um, and I think one of the issues we've got about being women at the bar is that when you get more senior, you get far more distance from your roots. And when young people look at us to see, can they be us? The danger is that we just seem too old, you know, too white, um, too distant from anything they aspire to. And this was what I read about Rose that made me realize that the charisma, which has been spoken about so eloquently by Hillary and by others, is that type of spark which means if you've got it you can hold out the hope of being a barrister this is rose hellbrun's words when interviewed by um the daily express upon becoming britain's youngest woman barrister okay um as she told the daily express the general impression of a woman lawyer seems to be a sober old maid i've not adopted the law as a hobby i'm serious about my career but that does not mean i should give up dancing swimming golf or tennis Legal problems will not keep me from other jobs. I love housekeeping and gardening. When I marry, I intend to continue as a barrister. I have many men friends. Some have possibly fallen in love with me, but I have no plans for marriage. I'm not in love. That does not mean I'm sacrificing my life and my career. I am a home lover. And that's, that's the woman, age 25, the youngest female barrister, having the confidence to claim her space in interview with um, the uh, Daily Express and that confidence and charisma, that love of life and that desire to carve her own route comes across so strongly in all the other interviews I've read with her. I mean, she is, she was a remarkable woman from her time, but reading that, she's still remarkable because how many of us will be confident going into print and claiming, you know, our femininity, claiming our career, claiming our choices and not limiting them in the way she did. I, I, I think I fell in love. We, we heard from the Lord Chief Justice um, about Lady Arden stepping down and obviously we are down to one woman on the Supreme Court. But what really um, stuck, stuck with me when Lady Arden um, spoke at her valedictory on Monday was um, at one point she talked about as she was coming up in the profession, women were invisible. Now, obviously, we have here a very rare example of an extremely visible woman, but most women that were operating in the legal profession did not have the media personality that Rose um, enjoyed. They very much operated in, in, you know, under the radar, maybe with way more, um, uh, less developed practices, very often pushed down a path they didn't want to take. Um, not necessarily, you know, being able to do commercial law very, very, very late in the day. But the other thing that really struck me um, around not just visibility, but also what Hillary said earlier, that everything came later to Rose. And I want to talk about this from a current generation perspective. How will we stop making women wait? Whatever, you know, how do we stop um, burdening them with the expectation in order to achieve you've got to be outstanding? Um, can we have a time when everything comes at the right time for women today? I'll start with you, Mark, because it feels like a question that a man needs to take first. <laughs> Not saying men held us back in any way, but it feels like the pace of acceleration. What can we do sure, to make I mean, a difference? I mean, I think that there are um, 
there are women being appointed as judges at different ages. I think we, for example, here, if you look at the age mix, I think the youngest judge we've got here now is just 50. And we've got some um, Wendy, who I know is on the um, on this on this um, event and spoke a bit earlier, is coming to her retirement. So we've got people who uh, are at both ages or both ranges of their time as a judge. But I think the the honest answer is that um, I and I saw one of the questions that came up that somebody wants to know how to become a, a judge. I think the important thing is whether you're a male or a female is actually you can be appointed as a judge. Um, at quite a young age, you can come at quite a, a later age, but we are certainly here at the Old Bailey, everyone gets appointed on the basis of their, their merit. And of course, if you're coming to do serious crime at the Old Bailey, you're going to have to have garnered several or many years of experience of doing that sort of work, either at the bar or as a solicitor, and sitting um, and dealing with crime, and then going on to deal with really, the really serious crime as a judge. But I, I hope... So the youngest appointments here, Anuja, I know was just under 50 when she came here. So it shows that actually you can be appointed as a senior judge at the Old Bailey at, at what some people might say is a comparatively young age for judges. Um, the retirement age, if, we're, if we read the parliamentary debates as right, it is about to go up. But it means that people can start sitting as a judge, coming here. And I hope um, the experience of having a broad, diverse range of judges sitting here will encourage people from all parts of the professions to see this as a natural place to come and sit um, going forward. Thank you. I will come to you, Anuja, because I know you're sitting on the JAC and um, they have obviously made great progress. They have achieved parity, at least in one of our courts, which is fantastic. But how can we get this timing right? How can we get women to feel that um, when they choose to go down the path, the judicial path, they can achieve that and unlike Rose who felt I think she had to wait quite a while for the high court um, we can get the timing right for the, the current generation for the future generation we think about this and also how do we measure their achievements in a way that are, is fair and it, it gives people the opportunity to really embrace the judiciary rather than keeping them at the door and I think the short answer to your question is, uh, do women have to wait longer than men? I think the answer is no, they don't. And they shouldn't think that they have to. If you want to apply for a judicial appointment, be rest assured that there is only one criteria for appointment, and that is merit. And at the Old Bailey now, all of the female judges currently sitting have been appointed through a JAC exercise and every single one of them has been appointed on merit. And that's quite exceptional if you think about it, because it isn't really that long ago when judges were appointed from a system which was referred to as a tap on the shoulder. So I, my advice would be, don't wait. Find out about the role that you want to apply for. Do your research. Go and sit, if you can, and in that court and see what the kind of work is that they're doing. Think carefully about the application that you make and what you put on the application form. Think carefully about your referees and prepare for the selection day. But certainly just approach it as if, um, if it's the job you want and the job that you've got the skills to do, that you will be successful. Oh, thank you. I think another question that com comes up quite um, often, I think it came up again, but in a very positive way because um, Rose managed to combine her life with her work, she had a family and she was a working mother. And very often we have this question, can you be a mother and successful lawyer? Can you, you know, reach the very top of the legal profession and will motherhood hold you back? I see there is a question in the chat as well on this, um, on this subject. So I said to Joe and Lorianne around this topic, I saw it actually came up again during the research that was released today by the young barristers. Um, it is a genuine concern. Can we juggle everything? Should we be expected to juggle? And does that make our task of really going all the way to the very top an impossible one? So which one would you like to start, Joe or Lorianne? I mean, Go on, Okay. <laughs> Motherhood at the, the bar. Just, just picking up just on, on the, the, um, the, the parity issue in terms of, you know, the really good question about what you do in order to be appointed and the application process and so forth. I think it's important not to miss the, the important disparity that still exists as between the intersection of women 
and race on the bench because there is a significant and woeful underrepresentation of black women, Asian women, of women of all mixed ethnicity on the bench. And I think that that is something that is uh, needs and requires close examination. And while of course we must celebrate, um, and no one celebrates more than me walking into the Bailey and having a 50-50 chance of getting one of the most amazing judges in our country, there is still, there is not a black woman judge that sits at the Old Bailey or ever has. And these are, these are um, issues that we need to keep our eye on and we need to take active steps to address while still celebrating the remarkable progress that we have made as, as a profession. Being a mother at the bar, I came to the bar when I was, well, I came to the bar as a single mum. I had my daughter at 18, she's now 27. I had absolutely no idea what to do with this screaming kid while running around the country trying to find pupillage, pay back my massive student debt, all the while trying to be good at what I did, knowing I had to work twice as hard to get half a far, not least because I was a woman, but because I was black, working class and a woman. I have to say, however, that um, while they are, of course, obstacles, my experience of of the bar and my career, which has spanned 22 years, has been one where I have used those um, objective adversities um, as a platform upon which to excel. And the adversity that I faced as, as a mum, as a young mum, as a single mum, uh, and also whether, whether you're a single mum or not, you still feel that sense of you feel that you're, you're neglecting your child, no matter what you do, where you are, if you're not at home, you feel like you're neglecting your child. The bar has not always been friendly to women with children, but it, it's possible. There are certainly now um, more networking systems in place. And we as women, we tend to stick together more. We tend to feed off of each other in terms of ways in which we can manage our practices, manage motherhood and manage career progression. And so it, it still is very difficult, but it certainly is, is possible. And, and I would say that for me as a, a working mum, it's very important for me to show my children, I have two now, um, that it's, it's possible uh, and that we, we don't simply say it cannot be done. In fact, it can be done. And there are many women, most of the women I know around my call are mothers and they've been able to manage and they've been able to, so don't let it put you off. It's like any other profession, you, you do it. There is support, it's not cheap. Um, but it's about, I think, going, um, looking at the network systems that exist and are in place in order to allow you to do both. Jill, sure. would you like to come in as well? Yeah, I think Lorianne has just demonstrated exactly what we need to do, which is to talk honestly about what our lives comprise outside of simply being a barrister or a judge. When I started off as a barrister, and I, I have three children now, but when I um, was um, a young working mother with three, I didn't feel able to say I had children. It was something I kept entirely divorced from my working life because I felt I had to be the person that was always available to do the work, was always doing the emails at two or three o'clock in the morning and prided myself on never letting anything go and did that the cost of me being honest about the toll it was taking on me and on my family life. What Laurieann has just done is said very plainly, I had children and I came, but it was a struggle, but it was a struggle that was worth it. Secondly, what Laurieann has done is said, look at me, I am here and I've survived and I've thrived and things are getting better. Thirdly, what Laurieann has done is, illustrate, is held a mirror up to those who are thinking about whether the bar is for them and already, made it more approachable by talking about her journey to the bar. And I think there's one, one of the reasons I agree to be on the panel tonight is because it's very, very important that first of all, we tell women you should be ambitious, which comes back to the question that was asked. Too many women have the skills to apply to be a recorder or to apply for silk, but hold back because they just don't think they can fit every single bullet point on every single competency because they doubt themselves. And if they can't complete it to 100%, then they doubt and they don't apply. Whereas a guy will give it a punt. And when women get knocked back, they think it's them as opposed to the wrong timing or too many competitors at the time. If a guy gets pushed back, they tend to think, oh, I'll give it another go. And that's not me saying that. That's what the data coming back from the Bar Council was revealed by those who were applying. So the first thing we have to do is to tell women that you are entitled to be ambitious. 
And being ambitious means that you you say it out loud and you don't hide behind this sort of humbleness that thinks, am I worthy? You are worthy and therefore you apply. Secondly, you look out for other women to support you because the other reason I'm on the panel tonight is because being mentored and being a mentor is one of the things we have a duty to do for those that are coming into the bar. And that's how we can positively make sure we are more diverse and inclusive at every single level. And so the legacy that Rose left us is that she showed what could be done. She showed how you could be a working mother with support. And we can't ignore the fact that you can't, you can't take on every battle alone and not get through it without asking for help for some people and about being honest about when things don't work. And when we have systems in place that actually enable us to be working mothers and to succeed, for example, under COVID, we have dealt really well with remote working. There has been far less instances where we've had to chop and turn in order to get back for childcare because we can flick a switch on a video recorder and that means you can go and do what needs to be done for your child or for your elderly relative you're caring for. When we talk about caring responsibilities, it's not just children. Women tend to still have the major caring responsibilities within the family and also that tends to be a responsibility dealt with by those who can't have paid help within the home. So it's an income issue and it's a an issue to do with race and background. So if we are more open, I think, about saying what the pressures are, then we are more likely to demand answers in order to deal with them. But glossing over the problems, as I did in my early years, is something I think has not long since been consigned to the past. And I applaud Laurie and for being able to say what she has done because she is leading the way. And it's quite right that she's going to be a silk of the future. And just by saying what she has done, I'm sure she will inspire many others to think that's a woman I can follow. I just want to go to you, Anuja, to talk a little bit about standing out in the right way. Because very often when I look at the history of women, very often they say, well, I was the only one, but I made the best of it. Because in fact, I also had the advantage of being visible, even when I didn't maybe want to be visible. So how can we turn this kind of moment of maybe not being the majority, although on the solicitor side we are, maybe not being the majority at the very top of the profession yet. And how can we make an impact by using the fact that we may be in the minority, fewer of us, but if you like punch harder and be you know, more impactful. So sometimes being different can also be a superpower or maybe not. Anuja? Uh, before I just get to that, can I come back on a couple of things that Joel uh, and Laurie have said? Uh, what they've both said is that you have to be brave you have to believe in yourself and back yourself. And if there are other competing interests, whether that be children or elderly people, you have to find a way to manage them that isn't inconsistent with your own ambitions. And you know, if you look at the just at the Bailey now, of the women judges there, three of us have school-aged children. And we all manage that with the help of, of Mark because he understands that that means that we won't be able to do certain events in the evening or events at lunchtime that normally judges would be expected to do. And that's because the women now are more honest about it. And again, this is the point that Laurie made and Joe made. They, they speak about it. They ask for support and help. And we have many more leadership judges. We're lucky to have one at the Bailey. who understand the pressures that are on working mothers and will make changes to accommodate them. So I think the more that people speak about combining caring responsibilities, home life, family life with a career, uh, the more that we will accelerate the change that needs to be made. And just to come back to the question that you were asking, in terms of differences, the huge advantage for me, and I'm sure Laurie and Joe felt the same when they were coming into the profession, was that, of course, we were different when we walked into a courtroom. You know, I rarely, when I was starting off in the early 90s, did I walk into a courtroom and see anybody that looked like me or had my accent. Uh, and it's easy to think that that's necessarily a disadvantage, but you can also make it an advantage because it means that you stand out. So if you do a good job, people will remember you. And I didn't find that judges were all necessarily hostile. And if they were, it lasted for quite a short period of time. 
until they knew that you had worked hard and that you could be trusted. And so what happened then is that you very quickly can build up a practice because people will remember who you are and the work that you've done. So I think what I would say to people who feel that they won't be treated equally or that there's some way in which there's a disadvantage to them because of their background or the color of their skin or the school that they went to, what you've got to remember is that if you back yourself and believe in yourself, then you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. And as, as Laurie said, there are lots of support networks now available that perhaps weren't available before. And so don't be afraid to ask for help and to take help when it's on offer. Oh, amazing. I wish I could start again and have you all <laughs> around me. I might still practice. Although I have to say, I am back on the solicitor's role. So that's already a step. <laughs> Mark, you were going to come in at one point. I'm sorry. Um, that, that does, in, in fact, um, Anuja um, made the point that I was going to make, which is about the fact that we have three judges here with school-aged children. I think the other thing I just wanted to come back to also was uh, Laurie-Anne's very important comments about uh, ethnicity and eth ethnic diversity in the judiciary. I mean, that is something which we all need to make sure is properly addressed at all strands of the judiciary, whether it's here, High Court, um, or, or indeed sitting in tribunals. I mean, that there are a huge number of people who sit in judicial capacities and we just need to make sure that actually um, the judges of tomorrow do reflect society and that is something that I've commented on in relation to Old Bailey appointments and it's something I feel very passionately about um, to make sure that actually um, people do feel that they can come and sit here and anyone I've made this um, offer before anyone who's very interested and wants to come and sit with one of us they just need to let me know and we will make that um, happen. Oh, that's wonderful. I might be first in queue. <laughs> you might find me. <laughs> <laughs> you might, you might, um, you might be flooded um, tomorrow. Uh, but thank you very much for the offer. That's just wonderful. Um, so just because we're coming up to the close of tonight, and I don't want to overrun, I want to feel very disciplined um, and in control of the evening timetable. I want to come around to each of you and ask you, you know, um, for final remarks on Rose, Rose's legacy, but also, if you like, for one message to future generations that are feeling anxious, um, they're feeling COVID might not have provided the kind of opening of the profession they hoped for. Um, there is a lot of uh, concern around, you know, uh, can they work remotely? Um, will there really be diversity? Will they be embraced for being different? All these kind of questions. There's a lot of anxiety among the younger generation and students. They have a lot of worry about whether the bar and the judiciary and the legal profession is for them. What is the one message you want to pass on to them? Um, and I'll start maybe from you, Joe, if you wanted to, to have a go at it. Okay. Um, being a barrister is a very lonely profession because when you're on your feet, it's only you that knows what question to ask next and you hold the responsibility of representing your client's case to your best of your ability. But as soon as you leave the courtroom, it's an incredibly compassionate, supportive environment where you get a lot of encouragement and courage from those you work alongside, even in for your, when they're your opponents. And I think my message to the youngsters joining is from the earlier stages, surround yourself with people who can support you. So, for example, join organisations like Bridging the Bar, join organisations um, such as the Women's Forum, join women in the criminal bar, which I've seen coming up, join women in family law. When you do, you'll be embraced by a network which actively wants to reach down and bring you into the profession, not keep you outside. And so whatever stage you are, make sure you surround yourself by people who are positive about you, because you're going to need that when times are tough, because we all go through them. But the bar is actually one of the most supportive, collegiate, compassionate, kind, professions unlike the type of trauma and difficulties you deal with deal with in the courtroom so don't be put off um just ask because there are very many people here who want to help and if there's one quality of roles that we need to remember as we go forward what would that be be yourself the as a barrister you are instructed because 
of your skill base, because of your personality, because of your name, because of the way you use words, because of the way you are with the clients, because you are an individual. And Rose was the type of woman who carved a space out because she absolutely kept the essence of herself, her wit, her charisma, her intelligence, her fun, her courage, her ambition. And so Rose, I think, on every single one of those categories was an inspiration then, and she's absolutely a role model uh, moving into 2022 and the next decade and 50 years beyond. I come to you, Mark, for, um, next for your for your message to future generations, your letter to them. Right. Um, well, I, I think picking up on a similar theme to Joe, in a sense, I think the key word I always think is perseverance. Um, you've got to be determined and you've got to persevere at the bar. Um, applying for pupillage, I, I suspect I'm one of many people here who applied many times for pupillages, didn't succeed at first, and you had to keep applying. At the end of pupillage, you then got to apply for a tenancy and you need to persevere. I came from a background where I had no connection in the law. A lot of what Joe says about the um, tremendous support you get from the bar is, is absolutely spot on. But I felt I had to say I had no family, had no other connections um, with the law. I went to a comprehensive school in North London and I fell into studying law at university. I, I know I was a great worry to my mother as to quite how I was going to make ends meet ultimately. Um, she, she died many, many years ago, so didn't get to see uh, where I've ended up. But if I've ended up um, where I am as the Recorder of London, perhaps it shows that other people can do that by perseverance and hard work. Uh, those are my thoughts um, going forward. And the one quality of Rose we should take forward? The one, I think, so the one thing is you, uh, going back to um, what Anu just said about appointment, it's all based on merit. So you've got to strive to be the best you can and you've got to persevere with your talents to get through to where you want to get to. I come to you, Lorianne, next. So the one quality of Rose will feed into my um, very short narrative to, to those people considering a career at the bar. Um, it's fearlessness you've got to strip away any fear of failure. You've got to strip away any of those voices on your shoulder behind you in the press and the media that says, this is not possible because X, Y, and Z. And you've just got to put your toe in the water. So you have to be fearless. Um, and of course, you've got to be prepared and you've got to be exceptional and you have to, got to have courage, but you do have to be fearless. So when I came to the bar from a, a very, very working class background, um, all I wanted <laughs> was to pay back my student loan, which was more money than I could even calculate, and to get a red bag. I still don't have a red bag, <laughs> but um, never in a million years would I ever have dreamed that I would have dipped my toe into the water and found so much riches. I have been embraced by the profession and I have become the profession and it has become me. And I never would have done that had I been on the outside looking in and had listened to all of the reasons why this was not a job for me. It absolutely was. So be fearless, um, take a risk, prepare, and use your adversity as your strength for this reason. Those in the profession who have not had to face the adversity that you as a woman or you as a woman of colour, you as a working class person has not had to face, has not had to develop the skills to overcome that adversity. The skills that you develop to overcome your adversity, whatever it might be, are the precise skills that you need to be a brilliant advocate, a brilliant judge and a brilliant um, judgment of, of character. And so use your adversity as your strength. Be fearless and go for it. We are here to help. Reach out. <laughs> oh, thank you. I hope you get a pair of gloves, um, maybe red gloves for your <laughs> silk ceremony. On the red bag. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if they are allowed. Obviously I mean, wasn't I remember, a good junior. <laughs> I remember having Nemony um, Letbish tell us the story about the old Bailey pink gloves um, remark that she had when she once appeared, she turned up with um, pink gloves mm -hmm. and they were quite surprised by her color choice. Um, but hopefully you will have, uh, you might even have her gloves for your ceremony. Um, I, I know they are being presented to various people, so you never know. Um, Anuja, over to you. Uh, my advice would be to enjoy it. Every case, every client, every courtroom that you will go to, they're all different. 
um, find out what area of the law you enjoy most. So I, I started off in, in commercial work, in fact, and it was Mary Arden's husband who gave me pupillage, Jonathan Mance, all those years ago in 1990. Um, and I think that you've just got to not listen to the people that say you've got to make choices. When I was at bar school, I remember going to a talk in which we were all told in that room that if you weren't white, you couldn't get pupillage and no one was going to take you seriously at the bar. And as a result of that, I think I applied for 23 pupillages because I thought I wasn't going to get any. Um, and I got the pupillages I wanted in the sets that I wanted and they funded me. So don't listen to people who say it's impossible. It isn't impossible. But do surround yourself with people who will support you, who will be kind to you, and who will pick you up on the down days, because there are some for everybody in the profession, and will cheer you on on the good. And the one piece of advice that I would give to everybody is, you will make mistakes. Everybody does. Every barrister does it. Everybody's asked that question uh, and got an answer and thought, oh, no, what have I done? And um, everybody's made a closing speech and looked at a jury and thought, goodness me, I don't think they took it anything that I've said. And as a judge, you'll make mistakes as well. Um, we are not infallible. Uh, but don't worry too much about the mistakes. Someone else can sort those out. Um, invariably, there's a higher court that will do it or the judge will deal with it if you're an advocate. Um, concentrate on what you're good at and becoming better at it. But my real takeaway is just enjoy it because I've been involved in the legal profession. I was called in 1989, so it's 30 years plus. And I've, I have enjoyed every day. Every day is different. Every experience is different. And for me, it, I'm really pleased that I stuck with it because I've enjoyed it a lot. Oh, that's just wonderful. Thank you so much to each of you, Joe and Mark and Lorian and Anuja for coming with us tonight um, and celebrating this milestone. And um, just before we wrap up, uh, I am really delighted that we will return to an in-person event, I believe, um, in May, and it will be at the Old Bailey. So please stay close to the Next 100 Years Project to hear more about what we plan. This year, if I need to remind you, is the centenary year of the first woman qualifying. The first one in May was Ivy Williams. She finally made it through. She jumped the queue, can I say, but I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to tell her story nearer the date. Um, the next bigger cohort came up, including uh, Helena Normanton came in November uh, 1922. And the first woman solicitors also came in 1922. So a big end year of celebrations, I hope. We will um, have many, many reasons to meet together, to learn from the pioneers and keep taking the positive messages and the empowering stories about them forward so that the next generations feel they can succeed too. And hopefully, you know, we move away from the outstanding exceptional one to the amazing woman, which we know there are many, and we will see each one of them and help them succeed. And I leave you with my favorite um, um, title in a story about um, Rose Hybron, which is um, something that one of the criminals that she saved said about her, that girl Rosie, the best lawyer in the world. So read up about her. She is the greatest, so I hear, if uh, we need to take the criminal's word for it. He was, uh, you know, let off by her. So that was great, a great result. And um, so I hope you will enjoy to discover and continue to learn about her legacy. I hope you will stay connected to the project. Let's celebrate some more and let's drive change, but in a positive way. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. And I hope to see more of you in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you.